Why do we use diagnosis in medicine? Well, diagnoses are used to guide treatment choice and to make a prognosis about the long-term outcome for the patient. The diagnosis identifies the nature of the patient's ailment and makes it easier for the doctor and the patient to know what will happen in the treatment. In many medical branches such as oncology, orthopedics, infection medicine or cardiology, the diagnosis has also become a tool to classify what type of underlying biomedical disease mechanism it is that has affected the patient. For example, if it is a bacterial or viral infection, or a benign tumor or a malignant cancer. This has become a very useful aspect of a diagnosis, especially for clinicians that can use biological markers, such as blood tests and imaging, to make refined diagnostics and monitor treatment effects. However, psychiatry has not yet reached this phase. The psychiatric diagnosis has still very little to do with the underlying physiology of the disorder. A psychiatric diagnosis made according to the most widely used diagnostic manuals, ICD and DSM, is almost solely based on the descriptives of disorder. What symptoms the patient has and what characteristics the course of the disease has. Like how it was in the other medical branches in the early days, before the waves of bio biomedical research and discoveries. Thus, the diagnosis in psychiatry doesn't answer the question why. Why is this person ill? What's the etiology of the disorder? Why has she got this specific combination of symptoms? And why will she get better if I choose an effective treatment for her? This is frustrating for anyone involved. In this video, we will describe the research domain criteria, the RDOC project, a research framework that was launched a few years ago by the leading researchers at the National American Institute for Mental Health as a reaction to the current descriptive diagnostic. With RDOC, they wanted to move the field of psychiatric diagnostics forwards and to take into account the recent decades of neuroscientific research about human behavior and psychopathology. Critics mean that the RDOC is just a new version of an old idea, a vain wish for an etiologically based diagnostic system in psychiatry when we're still not ready for it. The debate is very active. Do we know enough about the underpinnings of psychiatric disorders to be able to create a valid diagnostic system on it? What more is needed to achieve this? The RDOC framework for psychiatric diagnostics has become an interesting and characteristic part of the new wave of neuroscientific psychiatry. It is representative for a larger idea of how psychiatric disorders could be conceptualized as biomedical disorders. So this is why we think it is motivated to include a module on this topic in this course. The DSM and ICD systems are based on categorical diagnoses such as depression, schizophrenia, ADHD and antisocial personality disorder. Given the symptoms and the course of the disorder, either the patient has a disorder or she hasn't. During the recent years, there has been an increasing criticism towards categorical diagnosis. One major point concerns their heterogeneity. Two patients might get the same diagnosis, depression, but for quite different reasons. The symptoms might manifest quite differently, and the underlying pathology might also differ considerably. Another is, this might hold the development back when it comes to finding tailored treatments and develop objective tests for diagnosis. Therefore, it would be interesting to have subdivisions of psychiatric diagnosis based on underlying factors such as neurobiology, neurodevelopment or genetics. The RDOC can be seen as an alternative theoretical platform that places a larger emphasis on brain-based correlates and neurobiological systems. As this figure illustrates, the idea is to organize research on different levels starting at the DNA and the cellular level and moving to the level of neuronal circuits. So the RDOC aims to step down from complex categorical diagnosis and instead get an improved understanding of crucial systems in basic human functioning proposed to be of importance to different psychiatric conditions. Investigating these systems in relation to psychiatric symptoms is a bit like the flip side of the coin. 
to understand deceased states through the lens of normal functioning. The RDoC was created to be a dynamic system that should be continuously updated. At present, it encompasses five higher order candidate domains. Negative valence, which reflects responses to aversive situations, such as acute threat or fear, anxiety or loss. Positive valence, which reflects motivation-based behaviors, such as responsiveness to reward or habit learning. The third domain, cognition, reflects systems such as attention, perception and working memory. Social processes, which refers to interpersonal aspects such as affiliation, attachment and social communication. For example, the ability to perceive someone's emotional state through facial expressions. The fifth domain, arousal and regulatory systems, is responsible for maintaining homeostatic regulation through energy balance and sleep. Functioning in these systems it is thought to be dimensional with no sharp boundaries between normal and abnormal. So for example, one individual might have a highly reactive fear system and be prone to anxiety and worry, whereas another individual is rather bold and fearless. And this could actually be clinically relevant. If two people are assigned the same diagnosis but differ in terms of proneness to anxiety and worry, they could represent two clinically distinct subgroups that should perhaps receive different types of treatments. RDoC is not designed to be implemented in clinical praxis as it stands today. It should rather be thought of as a framework for gathering research on brain-based and neurobiological correlates of psychiatric symptoms. To facilitate this, the RDoC includes a matrix that we can see in this figure. The matrix defines each unit of analysis that should be used to investigate the candidate domains and their underlying subconstructs. The primary focus is neural circuits, but then analysis should also include genetic and cellular factors, as well as aspects of clinical variance, such as behavior, self-report and paradigms. For example, in this figure we see some of the neurobiological systems and correlates that so far have been linked to their construct acute threat and fear. If we are to use the RDoC framework, how will that change research? Well, in classic methodology, a common setup is to investigate patients with one particular diagnosis in relation to a healthy control group. In an RDoC-based study, however, it will be important to examine the full range of variety in a given RDoC construct. So this could involve participants with different psychiatric diagnoses, including individuals with sub-threshold symptoms, and also a control group with different degrees of functioning in relation to the RDoC construct that is being studied. Now we have talked a bit about what the RDoC is and how it, on a, or a similar framework, could perhaps contribute to revision of the definition and assessment of psychiatric conditions. We need to consider RDoC from many perspectives. A common argument is that the RDoC represents a too strong focus on brain-based and genetic mechanisms when we still don't know so much about them. Another one is that it doesn't take into account the subjective experiences of having a psychiatric ailment. In summary, the RDoC project is still in its infancy and the candidate domains will be subjected to ongoing refinement and revisions as the framework evolves across time. So time will tell if and how the RDoC matrix or another similar framework could perhaps be translated into a clinically useful classification.